Um, we're going to, I'd like you to turn uh, to Psalm chapter 12, uh, Psalm 12, Psalm 12. Uh, we're going to begin our manuscript evidence class tonight, and we've now come to the issue of preservation, and we've, we've spent all of our time so far talking about the doctrine of, uh, you know, uh, revelation and inspiration from God, and making sure that everyone understood that, uh, the, the, you know, the, the Bible that we had comes from God. Uh, but the point that we've been trying to, or one of the exciting points that I like to work towards is the issue that, okay, the inspiration doesn't do you any good unless you have preservation. So we've now come to the doctrine of preservation, which we're going to be spending a couple of weeks looking at. The doctrine of preservation, what, preservation is, is simply the issue of preserving something, right? You, you have a, a, a can of preserves. What does that mean? You've taken something and you've preserved it over a longer period of time. The doctrine of preservation is simply the issue that God has kept his word throughout time, that his word has never gone out, has never, you know, the flame has never been uh, stamped out, but God has preserved his word. And then there's the issue of finding where that is. Uh, so I'd like you to, to look at Psalm 12, look at, look at verse number six as we read tonight. Psalm 12 and verse number six. The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. Forever. I want you to notice a few things there in those verses. It says that the words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of, uh, of, of earth. Um, what is it that's pure? It is the actual words that come from God. It's not a message that's pure. You know, when we talked about the issue of inspiration, how it's, it's not sufficient just to say that it's the message that's been inspired. It is the very words that come from God. We're looking for a book that has his words contained in it. And not only that, but you notice there that says that thou shall keep them. What is it that's being kept? The words are being kept. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. Now, if you are a Bible believer, just coming to that verse, absent of any other verse, you would come to the conclusion that God has preserved his word, would you not? Is, it, is there any ambiguity in that verse? Is there any, any doubt that's cast that God is not preserving his word? All right, so what I want to start out, we, we understand that then. I wanted to read that verse and then springboard into what we're talking about. We, we've come to, the, to this, this question of the issue of preservation of did the Bible that's been inspired, and I hope that you agree from the scripture that we've covered, that God has given a revelation and he has inspired the Bible writers to write down the very words of God, right? Now, if all you had was the fact that God gave a revelation and through inspiration, there was the writers who wrote down the words of God, you would be left with, there was a word of God in some original autographs, right? That would be all you were left with. How would you know that the words that were inspired ever made it to you? You wouldn't. And this is why the doctrine of preservation is important. There's, there's, I put on here, there's four popular views of the Bible. That, and by popular, I just mean, you know, commonplace that you might run into. There's the Roman Catholic view that says that the, the Catholic Church is the one who decides what is God's word, right? It is tradition that trumps scripture and the Roman Catholic Church says we tell you what the scripture is and what the scripture says and what the scripture means. We are the authority. That's the position of the Roman Catholic Church. They're the, they're the custodians of truth. The liberal view says that the Bible is filled with myths and legends and mistakes, right? This is the common atheistic view on the street when they don't want to be accountable to a God, they say, well, the Bible's full of myths. Okay, well, name me one. Let's start working through them. Because I've been studying the Bible and I can't find any. I can't find a myth. I can't find a legend. I can't find a mistake. 
The, the neo-orthodox view, and boy, that's a really fancy word, right? And neo, neo just means new, and orthodox just means like the, the tradition, like the common. So like this is the new common view that, um, that they believe that the Bible is outside of history. Like, for example, that means that <clears throat> Adam and Eve may not have been real people, but it was communicating a story, and it was the story that was being taught by God. And so it's not, uh, the, the Bible is not about being historically accurate. It's about conveying uh, good themes or, or, or things of that nature. They, they believe in the, the issue of Adam and Eve or the flood, because what is the flood teaching? That there's a consequence for behavior and things of that nature, right? And so that they take the story that's in the scripture and what it's teaching. Now, you might come across this neo-orthodox view if you watch like uh, popular Christianity or something like that. For example, some of you like uh, in the conservative wing, some of you may have heard of, of uh, like uh, da the Daily Wire with Ben Shapiro or things like that that you've heard of. And uh, one of the people that the Daily Wire hired was Jordan Peterson, the philosophy professor out of Canada who took a stand against having to use pronouns to describe people as them, they, their, her, them, whatever, you know. And uh, so Jordan Peterson took a stand against this and rose to, to, uh, to a claim, but he's a philosopher. And when he comes over to the Daily Wire, he does this uh, series on the book of Exodus. And he wants to do a series on every book of the Bible. But then when you listen to how they're talking about the Bible, he's dissecting it and thinking about it in a way of what is the story trying to teach? And see, you can be, you, you, if, you, if you weren't noticing and picking up on the subtle keys, you might actually think they're a Bible believer. <laughs> but they're, they're not a Bible believer. They're a neo-Orthodox view that the Bible is just teaching good principles and good morals, and therefore they're discussing it in a way to try to figure out what can we get out of this. And what I'm saying is we are a Bible church. We believe that the Bible is the very word of God and is the final authority for all matters of faith and practice for us. It is not just a, a, a book that's filled with stories that we try to get good principles out of. It is the very word of God. The, 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 uh, the issue for the neo-Orthodox theology is that the Bible is not the word of God, but it simply contains the Word of God. Do you notice the difference? Like it has some inspiration from God in it, but it is not the very Word of God. The fundamentalist view is that, yeah, it's the Bible. It's got some mistakes in it. This should be translated this way. Oh, this was not there in the originals and what, whatever it may be. And they make themselves out to be the final authority. You, I hope you understand the moment you start if, you don't, if the Bible is not your final authority, but you become the final authority and say this, that, and the other thing, that this should be there, what you're saying is you are smarter than the 47 men who translated the King James Bible from the proper source text. And by the way, those 47 men were better at those languages. Many of those 47 men, they, they, um, they knew Greek, Koine Greek, they wrote it, they, they, you know, like they knew it better than anybody. And I think the linguists today, if they were alive at that time, that the King James translators would run circles around the people that we have in our universities today. And yet they want to sit there and say, they made a mistake. No, no, I don't buy it. I don't buy it. If you're interested in the people who translated the Bible, there's a, a book called uh, The Translators Revived or something like, like that that goes through each of the men that translated the Bible. Those are people who believed that the Bible was the Word of God and they translated it from a believing standpoint and yet they had the, the background in the languages to be able to translate properly from a proper source text. Every other translation that you have, other than your King James Bible, is translated from a different source text. So if we, when we come to the doctrine of preservation, you have to first figure out what's the proper source. Look, if you want to drink water, would you rather drink from a crystal clear uh, flowing river that's coming out of Montana? Or would you rather dr drink from the, from the sewage that's coming down a river out of China? Right? You know my point, right? One of it's garbage, one of it stinks, one of it is pure. 
So the fundamentalist view, they have a problem because um, um, they just say, well, the Bible has, contains the fundamentals. And we're telling you that every word of that book is God, God breathed. We, 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 that's the position that we hold to. So <clears throat> all of those views would agree that you cannot, that you don't possess the very words of God in your hand, nor can you possess the very words of God in your hand because they don't hold to a doctrine of preservation. They will point out all the errors and the mistakes and it's just a story. You see, they don't think that you have the word of God. They take a different position. Every position outside of the plenary verbal inspiration position that we take leads to a position where you don't have the very words of God. And so this is important. It's important that you understand what the book is that you hold in your hand. Now look, if you disagree with us on that, you know, hopefully we've gone through enough verses leading up to this class where you've seen the doctrine of inspiration, and now we're going to start to talk about preservation. But if you disagree with that, then you're going to have to tackle what the Bible says about itself and just say, well, I don't believe any of it. Okay, so we think that the Bible is internally consistent. Um, turn over to 2 Timothy chapter number 3. 2 Timothy chapter number 3. I want to look at the issue of preservation here in, in 2 Timothy. I've written down the verses for you on that sheet of paper. Um, I've written down every verse that I plan to go to. I want you to be able to have that list. Um, because if, if we go through it or we start to run out of time, I want you to see... I want you to be able to see for yourself. You can take it home. You can look at the verses. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15. The Word of God says, and that from a child, Paul is talking to Timothy here, and Paul is, in reference to Timothy, says, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Now, if Timothy... Uh, had known from his childhood the Holy Scriptures, and his mom had taught him the Scriptures, and his grandmother had taught them the Scriptures, then that tells you of necessity they had copies of the Scriptures. They had copies of God's Word. Verse 16 says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. He's saying the Scripture was given by inspiration of God. It's God's Word. And in verse 15, he says, From a child thou hast known the Holy Scriptures. So Timothy had it. He had access to a book that had God's words in it. Timothy had access to it. It wasn't just a reference to the originals. You understand Paul's viewpoint here. What Paul is saying is our, view, our stand on God's word is not that, well, Timothy, you know, the, God's word was inspired in the originals, but there's no way you could have access to it because the originals are all gone. So, Timothy, you have to go out there and you have to try to re re recollect from everything and try to figure out what is the word of God. Is that what Paul says here? Paul says he had them. His mother had them. That's what churches and seminaries tell you today. We believe the Bible to be inspired in the original autographs. That's like saying I believe in purple polka dotted unicorns because they don't exist. There, were there original autographs at one time? Yes. Were they ever collected into a book? No. Are the original autographs still around today? No. So then they don't have a Bible that they believe in. Don't let them lie to you and tell you and make you think that they believe in God's word, that they have a book that they can point to and say this is the source of truth while they speak out of the other side of their mouth and say in the original autographs. Well, where are those at? Oh, well, they don't exist. Well, where's God's word today? Well, we, we don't have it. Well, the best you can have is in the NIV or the ESV. Oh, the best I could have? Why is it only the best I could have? Where are God's words? They were only in the original autographs. So when, when, when Paul says the scripture here, he wasn't referring to something, something in the past that no one ever saw. Paul is saying, Timothy, you had it. 
Your mother had it, and they taught it to you, and you had access to it. Nobody has ever, ever seen a Bible of original manuscripts. Never existed. The Bible was written over 1,500 years. Never existed. So this is when Paul says that you had the scriptures, this is not a reference to something that Timothy couldn't find. It's a reference to copies of it. Inspiration and preservation go hand in hand, and the text teaches both of them. I want to talk about the promise of preservation. When we talk about preservation, I'm telling you that God has promised to preserve His Word through history. And God has promised this because He wants you to have it. You see, there was a... If you go back into history, there was the people in the 1900s who were fighting the issue of the, on the doctrinal statement of, of, of believing the Word of God. You go back to the seminaries. You know, you know all of the, the, the Ivy League schools used to be seminaries, right? That, that trained men for the ministry. And then what happened? The Jesuits, they came in, they attacked it. The liberals took over, and we lost the battle. And now they're the bastions of liberal think tanks that, that, that sculpt people's minds into a way where they're not serving Christ, but they're attacking Christ and undermining Him. You see, back then, they took the position on God's Word that there was, it was only the issue of the original manuscripts they made it like God had created a manuscript back there, but He wasn't preserving it. And I don't think that they were standing on the Word of God, and so therefore they didn't have a foundation. And I think that played into the erosion of the fundamentalist movement in the early 1900s. Where's your foundation, church? The pillar and ground of the truth. Where's your truth? They didn't have any. And if you don't have any authority, what are you going to do when you go out and talk to people? who want to know what your source is. Now, we've come full circle now. You go out to the liberals, they don't care what your source is because they don't have a source themselves, and they don't care about a source. <laughs> What's true for you is true for you. What's true for me is true for me. So the doctrinal statements of today, they don't, they don't deal with the doctrine of preservation. They omit it. We stand for it. Because if God has written a book, you need to know that you can have it. And oh, by the way, who determines what that book is. Is it the Roman Catholic Church? Do they tell you? If the doctrine of preservation is an issue and it is real, we then need to figure out where the doctrine of preservation is in the Scripture because we're not going to hold to a doctrine of preservation just because we say it logically needs to be true. We're coming at this from what does the Bible say about itself and what does the Bible say to be true. So you need to be aware you need to be aware of this. Look, I, <clears throat> you may think, I, I'm sorry, that's, that's not a kind statement. That I, what, I think about myself and my own mindset. I went for, to church for many of years because I thought it was just a place to be around nice people, right? And I knew that Christ had died on the cross, and I thought, we're just coming together, and, you know, this is just fun, and we're just, this is, it's nice to be around nice people. But then when you start learning about the book, you realize we're in a battle. We're in a spiritual war. And there's spiritual warfare going on. There's spiritual warfare going on for your mind, for your spouse's mind, for your kid's mind, for your neighbor's minds, for the, for the church's minds that you're a part of. And the way that Satan is coming in and trying to attack is he's trying to undermine your authority. He's trying to undermine your source of truth where, you could, where your not, mind could be renewed and stand on truth and not be moved off of truth and start living like this world in, in, in a world of chaos and insanity. Christians turn on the news and they say, well, how could it ever get like this? Where did this come from? That's so stupid. Who would ever believe that? Huh. When you don't have a foundation of truth, where are people going to go? There's no limit to the rebellion. 
When Romans 1 tells you that when they didn't like to retain God in their mind, they became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. They became fools. And then they go down this road of chaos and rebellion against their creator God. And so what do you find being attacked today? The very things that God has put in place. One of the primary things that I want us to do at this church is to stand for the institutions that God put in place back in Genesis. When he made them male and female. And when he said that it is good, not good for a man to be alone, that the two should become one flesh. And so we want to stand for marriage. And when it says that they should be fruitful and multiply, and so the two should have a family. And so we should look to protect the family. We should look to protect marriage. We should look to protect our children. And, and these are the things that we should be looking to protect because when Satan comes in and the world wants to attack God, what, are, what, are, what is he attacking? The very things that God put in place to be the building blocks of society. Satan's not coming up here trying to knock off the tip of the, 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 the flag that you put at the top of the castle. Satan's coming in trying to take out the very cornerstone of the castle because if you can get the foundation out, what happens to the rest of the structure? It completely implodes and it comes apart. So when I, when you, you say, Brandon, we're just talking about the Bible. Why are you getting so worked up? Because it matters. Because if you don't have a source of truth that tells you what are the pillars that God put in place for this world to be built upon, the authority structure that God has put in place, and how things should operate, then you have no foundation in which to be able to serve Christ and to stand for Him and to be a good soldier and to fight the fight because you don't even know what you're supposed to be doing. I know that because that was me. And I'm not saying I've got it all figured out. I'm just saying I now see. <laughs> the more I read, the more I observe, the more I see. And when I see Satan that shows up in the Bible, I see him undermining God by undermining his word and his authority. And so if I see this debate over God's word today about what's true and what's right and what God's word should be, you know what I'm thinking in the back of my mind? Spiritual warfare. Satan's attacking the foundations. Man your battle stations. Find out the battle plans. Fight the good fight of faith. So Satan's wanting to corrupt God's Word. You have the King James Bible, and we see revivals go on in the English Empire that come from God's Word being translated and being spread. And then you find some men called Westcott and Hort who find some other texts and say, hey, we think these, these copies that we have over here are newer than those copies that you translated the King James Bible from. Never mind the fact that we found it in the Vatican, because we all know we can trust the Roman Catholics. And never mind that we found the other one in, 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 in a monastery in Sinai on a garbage heap. Never mind that. Never mind the fact that when we take these two and compare them together, they disagree with each other all the time. And those thousands of manuscripts that you use to translate your King James Bible from are all consistent. Never mind the fact that these two that we're going to take disagree with themselves completely all the time. These have to be the best. And then they promote them as being the best. And then they make money from them being the best. And then we translate every, every, every translation that has come out since the authorized King James Version has come from the Westcott and Hort text, the minority text. They call it the minority text because there's just a few manuscripts over here that they say that are newer, so therefore they're better. I'm telling you that Satan has come along to try to corrupt the Word of God. He saw the impact that God's Word was having, and he says, how can I undermine it? How can I attack it? I know, let me throw so many versions at them that they won't even know which one's the right one. I'll have them swimming in corruption. The words of the Lord are pure words as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them 
from this generation forever. Let's pray. Father, we're thankful for your word that we have. Father, may we stand upon its truth as we look to your word to see what it says about itself. May we understand that the issues that we're dealing with here are serious. They're life-changing. They've impacted the whole world. They've corrupted the whole world. It is the truth that we have to be able to stand on to fight the corruption of that world so that our neighbors might not be lost and we might know the things of you. Draw us closer to you in Christ's name. Amen.